He's an Elite Series rookie, but also an Elite Series champion. It took him a grand total of two Elite Series events before he won one. This week, the Cowboy, Joey Cifuentes, joins me on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Well, let's do this again. Welcome one, welcome all. Friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Welcome in once again to the number one rated podcast on this particular channel. This is episode 112, and a moment of total honesty, I'm not really here right now. I mean, well, well, God willing, while you're watching this, I am in um, Orange, Texas, where it is very, very hot. Um, but as I've proved before, I'll always be here for you guys on a Wednesday. Um, and I thank you guys being here for me. This week's guest, a neat one. He won an Elite Series event earlier this year, but he's a dude that I, I, I don't know that well. I mean, I know a little bit about him, but I, I just don't know him that well. Um, he's the cowboy. I mean, is he really a freaking cowboy? Well, guess what? We find out during this show. We find out a lot of things. I mean, to be honest, he's been on a lot of podcasts, but he's still kind of, I, I know how he won the tournament and I know stuff like that, but I don't know a lot about him. Here's one thing that'll blow you away that comes up in today's conversation. The dude has brands on his body, you know, like, he's a couple of them and he's, his plans for another. Uh, so you're going to learn a lot about Joey Cifuentes on this show, and I hope you enjoy it. Without further ado, joining us right now from Arkansas, Joey Cifuentes. Joey Cifuentes, how are you this morning? Doing pretty good. How you doing, Dave? I'm good. I just already screwed up. I mean, this is going to air in the evening. I said this morning, the magic of... <laughs> The internet has been revealed, but um excited to do this with you because I know you, but I, I don't really know you. You know what I mean? We, we, we've we known each other for a few years. I mean, I've seen you at some pure fishing stuff, and and then obviously you fish the Elite Series, and I saw your route to the Elite Series, but this is an opportunity for me to get to know you a little bit better, and I'm going to start with the most obvious question on earth. Are you really a freaking cowboy? <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a cattle farmer. I, I raise cows. Um, I get out there and do some cowboy and I mean, I'll, I, I have to do it, you know, like, I mean, that's just, and I, and I do love to do it. Um, you know, there's guys that do it for a living that like ride a horse and rope stuff all the time. And, and, um, they're real cowboys, you know, like, uh, but, but, you know, I, I, I always say I don't really consider myself a cowboy, but I mean, I mean, that's what I do like on my off time. So, I mean, for sure, that's, that's uh, something I do, you know, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's a, it's a weird nickname. I was thinking about it, uh, you know, right before we went live and I'm like, you know, the, <laughs> the great Canadian snow leopard, Jeff Gustafson is clearly not a snow leopard, but no, nobody says anything about that. There's all these nicknames that come along and nobody's but a cowboy if you're gonna be a cowboy there has to be it's a weird nickname like you can't just live in the city and be like yeah i'm the cowboy on the weekends yeah um yeah like i said i mean there's i i don't wear the i don't wear the cowboy hat just for fun i mean i i love my hat um and it, you know i didn't start out fishing wearing a cowboy hat um when i was a co-winger and stuff like that but i i did wear a cowboy hat you know farming and all this stuff and and it's kind of funny how that all worked out. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's just, it's a nickname that I, I accepted this fine. I mean, I, I'm a country boy anyway, you know, I, I, I live outside. I hate being inside. I love being outdoors. That's why I'm so thankful to get to do, you know, what I do and fish. And, um, I couldn't sit behind an office all day, Dave. It's just not me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you there. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, you commit to the cowboy hat more than I imagined initially. Not that I spent a lot of time thinking about it, but I was like, he's the cowboy. He's going to wear it on stage and at takeoff and stuff, but then it's going to go in a nice compartment. 
you wear it all day competing. Is is a cowboy hat something that you've always kind of worn? Or like like when you're at home on a Tuesday going to the market, do I see you with that hat on? Yeah, yeah, you do. And and um yeah, I I wear it all the time. I didn't really wear it that much fishing just because it's it really is kind of like um when you're when you're running down the lake, you know, it's kind of a pain, but um but yeah, I, I wear my cowboy hat all over the place. It's it's actually why I'm wearing it fishing is because I I had a sponsor of mine here locally and I went into his place and, and I was wearing my hat and he was like, dude, why aren't you wearing that while you're fishing? And I'm like, well, you know, it's a good idea. And, and, you know, it, it does set me apart from folks. And, and yeah. that was a, that was a goal of mine. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, it, um, I'm not, you know, trying to be something I'm not, but it's, it's, a uh, it, it's a good way to separate yourself in this industry. You know, you need that. Um, so so yeah, uh, I, I wear my hat all the time. I mean, you can you can see me in Walmart. <laughs> I'll have her on. So, I mean, the upside to that too, as as your fame continues to rise, I would imagine things are getting. I mean, you could just take it off. It's like the Duck Dynasty dudes. Just shave that beard off, and probably nobody recognizes you as soon as you take it off. Correct? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, people people pro- definitely wouldn't know who I was without without the hat on. So it's good. So the basis of this hat, I mean, I'm going to bring it down to the lowest. I mean, I just think most guys make the decisions. At some point, your wife must have been like, you look spectacular in a cowboy hat. I mean, somebody had to build the confidence for you to be like, I'm going to I'm going to wear this all the time. Yeah, my uh, my wife. Well, they come from like a I come from a rodeo background. My wife's family does, too. So, like, she doesn't mind it. And I've been wearing it a long time. So she. He loves it, but what what a rodeo background? What 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 to tell me? Well, you know, back in back in high school, I when I moved to Arkansas, so I actually grew up in Florida. Um, when I moved to Arkansas, um, I got into some roping, like team roping, and got a horse and did all that. But I never really pursued it or got into it really big. It was just something fun to do on the side. I loved it. I was pretty, pretty, actually pretty good at it. Um, and, um, and so, but yeah, my, my goals through life in, in high school and college was to be a professional baseball player. Didn't want anything to do with, I mean, that's, that was my thing, like was baseball. So like, I just never went after it and, um, was, you know, I'm actually about to probably start getting back into it. I got a brother-in-law of mine. We're about to build a arena and we're going to start doing some roping and, kids you know i got two girls they're getting a little bigger now they want a horse and so we're gonna you know do a little rodeo how far did the baseball thing go for you um you know it it didn't go as far as i i mean it, it went good you know i i went to college played uh went to junior college went to a really good division two school i wanted to go to a big d1 and i hope to you know getting drafted and all that but um my the health on my shoulder and my arm and surgeries and stuff like that. It just, it just wasn't in the, wasn't in the cards for me, you know, but um, I, I think I had a really successful baseball career. I mean, there's a lot of guys that don't even get to go play college ball. So, um, and won some championships and stuff like that. So it was, it was good. Very cool. So, so fishing, has it been, did it become the competitive replacement for baseball? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, When matter of fact, as soon as I got done playing baseball, I like, I think college fishing just started. And, um, I, when I was at school, there was, there was some talks from a couple of guys that they want to start a fishing team. And there were some girls in there too. And, um, so, you know, naturally I, I was, man, I got in trouble on the baseball team all the time for going hunting and fishing on the lake. Like I remember, um, my coach, I was supposed to be at some workouts and he called me and I was like, I'm fishing on Lake Columbia, which is right next to Southern Arkansas university down there, in, um, Southern Arkansas. And like, you know, he made me come back and I, I got my butt chewed out and made me run a bunch for, for going fishing and stuff like that. So, so anyways, yeah, it, it, and then once I got into that tournament, you know, like, like the competition, like, yeah, it was just, I love anything competition, man. I'll, I'll challenge you at anything. So yeah, it just it filled that void for sure. So you had not competitively fished before this. Like, I mean, you 
we talked to a bunch of people and they're like, yeah, I fished my first tournament at 11. How old were you when you fished your first tournament? Um, I think I was probably 17, somewhere in there in high school. I had a, a friend of mine that I ended up going and playing baseball with like, uh, and, and he's the connection to Larry Nixon, but he, we became buddies through baseball and, and he said, Hey, you want to go fishing one day? So we just went fishing and said, Hey, you want to fish this Tuesday night or, and then I did that. So I had a, I had a little bit of experience in it during college, you know, in high school, you know, doing some of that, but that was probably the first time I'd ever fished like a little small local derby, you know? And how did you do in that tournament? Um, I don't really remember Dave. I mean, <laughs> Not well, we, evidently. yeah, I mean, it was so long ago. I, I, it wasn't like we had won or we, we had won a few or I don't, I think we had, um, you know, I don't, I don't really know, but, but either way, it was just like, it was exciting to go out there and like you're battling these other guys and, and trying to beat them and, and taking people's money. And, and mostly we got our money taken, but you know, that kind of keeps it going, you know, keeps you driving to go. So at what age did you start to think like, I think I can do this or I should start working towards this? Well, that's a good question. I, so actually it wasn't until, so when I got done with college, um, which was, I was what, I don't know, 20, I don't even know, 22, 23, somewhere. No, well, I'm 35 now, man, time flies. Anyways, when I graduated college, don't even know, in my 20s, you know, I got in with Larry and I and I went into fish as a co-angler with him. And really, honestly, just to do it because it's Larry Nixon and like how many people get the opportunity to go travel with Larry and fish in some bass tournaments. So when I went there, I fished, there was three tournaments. One was on Toledo Bend, Sam Rayburn. And then we went back to Sam Rayburn because of something happened with the weather or something. I don't remember what it was, but I ended up winning that last tournament. And I finished second in the points. I missed, missed, missed co-angler of the year on that division by like one point. And I was like, Hey, you know, this is pretty cool. Yeah. And so, so when I did that, I qualified to fish as a co-angler on the FLW tour with Larry and so I did that, um, and I ended up, you know, like I fished two seasons. I finished top ten in the points the first season. The second season, I won another tournament. But in somewhere in there, I was like, okay, I think I think I could maybe do this. But I didn't really know because you know I needed to get in the front of the boat. Yeah. And and during that time though, I was fishing some BFLs and stuff around the house, and I ended up winning on the boater side on Lake Dardanelle. Um. You know, and so that I think that moment when I won that tournament on Dardanelle, I was like, okay, I I can I think I can do this. Like I'm gonna probably pursue it, you know. Um, and then winning that tour event on Beaver Lake as a co angler and qualifying to fish out of the front of the boat on that FLW tour, I was like, shoot, man, I'm I'm all in. <laughs> so How- I mean, it it was later in my life, you know, before I figured it out. A lot of guys are like, man, they're trying to do this when they're young, but. I, I just didn't, that was just, wasn't a dream. I didn't follow bass fishing. Didn't even, honestly, when I moved to Arkansas, I had no clue who Larry Nixon was. And I really? was, yeah, 16, 17 years old, you know, like until I figured out like, Hey, this guy's, he's pretty good. You know, he's been around a long time. He's a legend in the sport. So a little different than most, most folks. How did you and Larry get connected initially? So my buddy, Logan, uh, he was the guy I played baseball with. Um, and his dad, his name's doc. We call him doc. He's actually my vet. He helps me work my cows. He's been helping us work our cows for a long time. He's a veterinarian. Um, Sounds like straight out of, of Yellowstone. Call doc. The cow. Yeah. 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 Yeah, (laughs) Sorry. He's, he is the man. He's the man though. I'm telling you, like, if you need something animal wise, like he's the dude. So anyway, so doc traveled with Larry um, while he was, you know, being a vet, like a long time ago, he went to the Red Man's or, and I think a lot of the other tournaments that Larry was fishing and he would just practice with them. He would fly up, practice with them, just get to catch some big fish, you know, like they're up north or wherever. And then he'd fly home Larry would fish the tournament. So, so when I met Logan, you know, 
that's kind of how we all got together. The whole group of guys would meet every Wednesday night. They called it Poker Palace. <laughs> and um, every once in a while, Larry Nixon would come in there and um, nobody would play poker. We just all talk about fishing. And so um, that that, you know, that's kind of how me and Larry got to meet. He got to know me. And and um, before he asked me, like, hey, you want to go fishing with me? Um, you know, he got to know me a little better. Yeah. And we we kind of became buddies and he saw that I had won like the BFL or well, you know, that I was in fishing. I think I fished a few college tournaments too and did well. So he was like, yeah, this kid's got a little bit of a knack. And, um, you know, he took me with me, took him with me. So, and, and ironically, you qualify for the elite series and guess who's yeah. back. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, that whole thing. I mean, I, and I had this, conversation with larry before i knew he was coming back about a 45 minute chat that i talked about it at the bass fishing hall of fame but did you know how long during that process like you qualified first obviously through the opens and then in that off season the deal was brokered to bring larry back so um how much do you think you had to i mean the fact of you being here did that did that help larry's decision yeah yeah. Oh, he wanted it when I got in there. Yeah. He wanted in there bad. And he, and, and I, when I qualified, um, you know, it was, it was a little, you know, it wasn't till cause that last tournament, I think the, the open was on Rayburn or something when everybody was like finalized to get in. I, I, I don't know if that's right, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he, he didn't know till after that, but he had heard like, you know, this is probably going to happen, but it's not a hundred percent. And uh, yeah, he was, he was, he was really hoping to get in there because I mean, you know, you got a, a, um, a travel partner you're comfortable with and, and, um, it just gives, you're not out there on your own, you know, and it, it does make a big difference because if I didn't have Larry going in this thing, I, I mean, I've got other buddies that I've met over the years that I probably could have got in there and roomed with. Um, but I would probably be on my own. Um, and that's, that's tough, you know, it's a tough way to, to go about it. You, it's nice to have some buddies to be with. Yeah, and they and they might as well be uh, bass fishing royalty, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Before we move on to all this pro, I gotta ask you about the back of the boat because, I mean, you're one of many pros that have started from the back of the boat and gone on to do some pretty incredible stuff. What did fishing out of the back of the boat teach you? And did, does it do you still think of some of those lessons when you're competing today? Yeah. Back of the boat taught me so much. Um, just different, you know, diff different styles of fishing. Um, how I get, it's what's a funny one, how bad a lot of people are at running the boat. <laughs> 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 um, I got to fish with some, some, and, and I mean, it's just, it is what it is, but, um, there's, there's a lot of folks that, you, you know, you learn though, like, man, why is this guy like have his boat turn over here when he's trying to fish this? So like stuff like that, that, um, you pick up on, um, a lot. I think I, you know, I've got, I've asked this or people have asked me this question a lot, like what's your style of fishing or, or what are your strengths? And co-angling to me is all about finesse fishing. Like, and I, the, some of the tournaments I won, I was like one of the tournaments I won was coming. I was throwing a big jig. The other one I was throwing a jig and a spinner bait. So that was not really finessing, but like, um, you learn to throw little baits to catch keepers. And like, so I, that to me, I feel like that's where I'm at. Like I love to finesse fish. So I, I learned that, that, that aspect. Um, and which was really good because Larry, he was good at, he's good at that too. So it's kind of worked out well, but, um, but yeah, man, I mean, just, it, I think the most, one of the things I learned that was the biggest thing about coing was, and I tell kids this all the time is you get to travel around the country and see all these different bodies of water. Cause I, you, it's hard to just go to a place and not know, you know, anything about it. So yeah. um, I think that's the biggest thing I learned, but, but definitely it's influenced my, my style of fishing, you know? So you qualified for, you, you, I believe you only fished the opens one year, right? I mean, you qualified th through three events, correct? Uh, well, no, I fished, uh, this is, uh, I fished the opens two years before, um, the year I qualified. Okay. Okay. And I, I fished one division. It was the centrals. 
uh, me and me and Brian, it was the year actually Brian, uh, qualified. Brian knew, Brian knew. Brian knew. Yeah. Um, and spaz. we stayed total spaz. Yeah. <laughs> we, we roomed together. Um, and I think all those tournaments, um, and I did terrible. I'm not gonna lie to you. I did terrible. It was a, it was actually a really bad, it, it seemed like a bad experience to me. Like it was ruthless. I mean, those, it, it was tough. I mean, it, we fished some places in the, in the amount of boats and like, it was kind of overwhelming. I just couldn't believe, you know, how people treated other people. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, it, it's hardcore, you know, I think yeah. a, a lot, a lot of people know that about the Bassmaster Open. Like it is not easy. I mean, there's, Anyway, so had a bad experience, and I I actually told myself after I fished, I was like, I'm not doing these again. I I was like, I'm I'm not fishing the Bassmaster Opens. Maybe it's just not meant to be. I and I and so I took a year off from doing them, and I was just focusing on the other tour I was fishing. And then, you know how things kind of started working out with it, and I felt like we were getting pushed back on what I was doing, and. And, um, I said, you know what, man, I, I need to, I, I feel like I want to try and transition over to this other organization because it may be tough to get there, but like, that's where I need to be. And, um, so then, yeah, I just, I fished it one more, I fished just the, the Southern, um, opens and, and yeah, man, everything, everything worked out. So how was th that transition? Like you said, you know, when, it's funny because w when the split happened, you know, everybody talks about the anglers that went to MLF and everybody talks about the new guys that went to the elites, but there's a group that is kind of the forgotten group that never get mentioned in that, but it's you guys, you know what I mean? Guys that were, that were fishing somewhere, making a living and thinking, you know, that at one time, everybody's like, oh, the FLW, that's the safe route, you know, <laughs> but when that, all of that started evolving and MLF bottom, like, that had to be a crazy thing to go through for all of you, just in the way that like, we've done the right thing. We've stayed loyal. We're here, but all of a sudden now we're nowhere. And I'm, you know, in my thirties and I got to find, and not just you, I mean, the amount of seasoned pros, you know what I mean? That have had to find a somewhere to go. How did that feel like going through it? I mean, I, I, I think I'd be laying on the ground in a fetal position, sucking my thumb saying, why me? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was kind of, it, it was tough, you know, but, but I was really trying to like, still try and get that win and establish myself, you know? Yeah. So like, I, I mean, it, it, it was tough, you know, I mean, it, it felt like, you know, we were just getting degraded and, um, you know, but, but that's it. Things happen in life that, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out. You just got to keep plugging along. And I, I didn't really pay attention to it too much, Dave. I just kind of kept doing my thing, fishing. Um, and, and it, it, it to me, like everything's going to work out no matter what. So I just, I just kept plugging along and, and, um, it is what it is, man. I mean, um, yeah, I don't know what I'll say about it. <laughs> yeah. So then you make the elite series and, uh, you know, first few events for a rookie in the elite series, I've always said it's super important. Like if you have, and when we start in Florida, I mean, if you have two or three bad ones in a row, it's so hard to that snowball starts going down the hill and you start wondering, can I be here? Can I, well, the best way to get over that is just go and win your second elite series of event. <laughs> How far ahead yeah. of schedule was that victory for you in your head? Um. Yeah, I mean it was it was ahead of schedule, but I I feel like really coming into the elite series, I felt like I had a chance at any moment right now. Like it it didn't matter if it was the elite series or what tournament, I was going to win. I had a chance to win. Like I had that mental. I still feel that way. Um, but like, yeah. So so I mean, it, it was ahead of schedule. Sure. I mean, because you never know like, Hey, am I going to be the guy that fishes for 25 years, 20 years and never wins a bass tournament? Like, or, you know, a major tour event. Yeah. Um, you know, that's in the back of your head. So, uh, but, but yeah, so, I mean, to get that done, it was, it was good. I mean, yeah, I got, I, I 
it, it was coming, man. I had close, I already had those opportunities like right there in front of me. And so I just had, I just had the confidence that it was going to happen. It, I treated it like it was just going into elite series. Like it was just any other bass tournament that I've been fishing for the past five years, you know? So. I would imagine too, thinking of, you know, how you had fished from the front of the boat up to this point. I mean, whether it was through the opens or the FLW stuff you had done, Toyota series stuff, there was always a co-angler. There had to be a certain freedom for, I would have, and nobody ever talks about this, but there had to be like, all of a sudden, I don't have to look over my shoulder. I am literally the only one casting on this boat. Did you feel a sense of freedom on the elite series all of a sudden? Yeah. Yeah. It's really nice, man. It, <laughs> um, it I'd really imagine. is it because I, I really, when I, when I have a co-angler in the boat, like I want them to have a good time too. Yeah. I really, I really do. Like I, I don't, I, I'll fish different. I mean, I won't go to, I won't get up there and, and parallel the bank. And so the guy's kind of like thumb up his butt has nothing to do. You know, I feel, I, I feel bad for him. I mean, it's just the way I am. I care about other people and like, I want them to have a good time, you know, this may be their first experience. So it's just kind of like how I am. So like, to be able to just do whatever I want, move the boat however I want, man. Yeah, it was it was, it was awesome. Loved it. <laughs> do you think you're a more attentive to a co-angler just because you were a co-angler? Yeah, I think that's a good, I think that's a good, um, I, I think you're right on on that. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Um, Co-angling is, is, uh, it's, it's, it's tough, but, um, I, I just, I, yeah, I don't even know what to say, Dave, I'm going to have to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the first time you realize we don't cut anything out. This oh, okay. <laughs> tell, tell, tell me this though. Um, did you have any, and I don't need names, but did you have any bad experiences at a co-angler? And if so, what was the worst? You know, I, I don't really, I mean, I had some, some bad experiences, but not like anything terrible. I mean, I, I fished with, with a guy one time that just did some really crazy stuff that took up a lot of time. Um, I rode with a guy one time, that just, he was an old, really older guy. He's pretty well known. I'm not going to say his name, but he hit some, he, he can't really see. <laughs> it was kind of scary, more like scary moments, like. We're running down the middle of the Tennessee River, and I think it was, I don't even know, I think we were on Chickamauga, and he just, I, there was a tree, and, like, I seen it kind of at the last second, and we rammed it. I, I'm surprised the motor didn't fly up in the boat with us and stuff like that, you know, but um, no, not not anything terrible. I mean, everybody was, was pretty good. I mean, I fished with some people that shouldn't really, I don't think they should be there, you know. I mean, they just didn't have a clue, um, but, but, you know. <laughs> that's that's all part of the learning experience do you think um your age you know if, if you take a 25 year old version of you and put you in the elite series do you win your second event or is part of what we're seeing i mean like you said you've knocked on the door many times i mean nobody was shocked to see you win i mean you're one of those guys that and i think that can be said of most of the elite series rookies now and moving forward i mean most of them are pretty tried true and tested and even the young ones that nobody knows anything about they're natural phenomena just to make it here yeah um ask the ask the question again do you think the 25 year old version of you is is is, is do you think your early success in the elite series has got to do with your maturity being a little bit older you're not a 22 year old pro yeah i i don't think i don't think going in you know, without the experience I had, I, I win the second turn of the year. There's, there's, there's no doubt it takes, you know, you hear people say it all the time, like it takes so many years to, to really get the confidence and see all the places and, and, you know, know how to, you know, fish them and all that different stuff. So, yeah, I mean, without the experience, I don't think so. And, you know, I've a good friend of mine, um, I, I, I'll use him as an example. I, it, he wouldn't mind. It's John Hunter. He's a, he's a good buddy yeah. of mine and met, met him through, you know, the tournaments and stuff. He, he was in the elite series and he was yeah. young and 
he didn't have the experience. If he was in it now, he'd, yeah, he'd have a chance to win a second tournament or first tournament. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I think the experience is, uh, you know, it, you, you have to have it. I mean, for sure. How has the experience, what is it like to win the lead series event? I mean, you didn't just win the lead series event, but you won the lead series event right before the Bassmaster Classic. You, you, what was that experience like as far as like, did it change? Did a lot more people know who you are or was it less or more than you had expected? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of had my fan base from whatever I was doing before yeah. and like the, the, the people really embraced me there at Bass, all the Bass fans, which I think is the best, the best fans in the fishing industry without a doubt. Um, so but yeah, I mean the fan base, you know, all the all all my all my socials and stuff grew. Um, a lot of a lot of people, you know, you get more recognition. I mean, it was it was it, if I if I had to choose, you know, like winning a tournament with Bass or with where I was at, you know, like it would have been. I would have. I'm happy I didn't win some of those tournaments over there that I had a chance to win. Like it 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 was perfect that it happened right there at Bass, you know. So. Um, it, it was sweet that you, you brought up a tournament that you had, you know, you had your chances and, and I think I was, yeah. I think it was kind. I mean, if it was like your fourth or fifth event, I would have been more evil and, and played up that a little bit more, but you left the dock with a seven pound lead once before. And I remember, I mean, that tournament was right, you know, just a couple hours from my house a fishery that I spent a lot of time on thousand islands. And so I was following that event. But to leave the dock with a four pound lead again, how much of that thought was going into your mind? You, you know, you, you lost a seven pound lead, a four pound lead. Like, did, did that help you win? You know, the experience that you went through, the painful experience, did, did it help you keep the wheels on or did it make it tougher? Yeah, it, it definitely helped. Um it, but it was going through my brain. I mean, there's, there's no doubt. I, I, I remember when I had that seven pound lead on the St. Lawrence river and like that night before the tournament, I was, I didn't sleep. I think maybe a couple hours because I never really wasn't in that biggest in that situation before you've got all these like winning moments in your brain. You've got the losing moments, but you're trying to like push out the losing moments. You want to just focus on winning and it's a lot of pressure. I mean, it, it is, it's a huge tournament. I mean, it, it just is. So yeah, I mean, going in that last day, but, but that helped me because um, now I didn't sleep very much the last night before the, <laughs> the final day on Seminole. I'm not going to lie to you. It was, it was all kind of like going, it was like the same stuff going through my head. Um, but I had that little bit more calmness, you know, like, Hey, I'm going to do my thing. Um, if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Instead of what I did on the St. Lawrence River was completely like went to my first place in area and I, they were there and I, they weren't biting and I just spun out and left and went and did other stuff and couldn't even catch, you know, 12 pounds or, or I don't even know what I needed. You know, I needed like 13 or 14 pounds of win or something. And yeah, so, I mean, it, it helped. And, um, you got to go through those things, man, to, to win big tournaments. I think when you say you spun out in that event, I mean, people use that term a lot, but to you, what, what happens when you spin out? Like, is it just everything? Is it the speed of your fishing's too fast? Like, I mean, what were the things, there must've been things that you were thinking going into the Sunday and Seminole, I'm not going to do this again or this again. When we hear anglers talk about spinning out, is it mental? Is it physical? What is it? Yeah, it's, it's mental. I mean, you, you just, you, you got too many different things running yeah. through your head. Like, you know, you, you gotta, you know, you gotta get this amount of weight or, or whatever it is, you know, you're just thinking about all these other things, except for like, you know, you've got the fish and all you gotta do is just figure out how to catch them instead of like man if they don't bite i gotta go over here and then i gotta go down there and try and catch some fish where i had some bites stuff like that. now you just focus on your area and what you're doing and stick to it now obviously there could be a point like a good really good angler may switch it up and go win a tournament but i think you know you just 
you stick with your plan and what got you to where you are, you know? So, so, so to have sleepless nights the night before both those events, is it just a situation where you try to sleep, but like you lay in your pillow and you're like, all of those thoughts just keep like, what? why can't you sleep the night before? It's the, it's just, like I said, it's your, your head's running. Like for me anyway, um, I tend to get a little nervous in, in situations. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's just the way I am. Um, I had to battle through that stuff when I was playing sports, you know, and you're sitting there, if you're pitching in a game and you're trying, you're trying to complete the whole game and try and get the win. And, um, you just have some nervousness, man. And then all these, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, like I said, the moment, the moments like the winning and like what's good, you know, just all the things that could happen yeah. are going, are going through your brain. And, and, um, you just, I don't know, man, it's just, this is the way it is. I, your, 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 your mind's running a hundred. Did Larry give you any advice the night before Seminole? Yeah. Yeah. Larry called me and, and basically just told me, um, you know, kind of what I said, like, you know, if the, if the fish aren't doing what, you know, exactly what you want them to do, or you're not catching them or what, sorry, a little dog barking there. Oh, that's fine. We're dog friendly uh, show. Um, uh, the dog, can come, the dog can come in if you want if you want to introduce the dog i mean everybody would love to meet the cowboy's dog that's my more of my wife's dog it's not oh. my dog but um okay <laughs> shut up shut up my my dog is a blue healer and she ca chases cows and um she wouldn't be in here barking she knows better um <laughs> <laughs> anyways but uh yeah larry just told me he said joey just stay calm like if it if if you're not catching them right there first thing you know just stick with your area basically what i said just kind of stick to your area um and and figure out how to get them to bite and you know don't don't spin out or freak out and 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 do do things you're you that that didn't get you to that point you know and and so that's that's basically what he told me and and it was great i needed that you know going in that last day yeah, and I mean, why have Larry Nixon as your roommate if if he can't give you? I mean, if you'd have said no, nah, he had nothing to say. I'd be like, what the hell, Larry Nixon? Of course. I mean, it's the moment in the movie where you got to give the big speech. Um, how cool was it to bring it, you know, to go back to? Uh, and I remember, you know, that week after you won, you know what I mean? You did a bunch of podcasts and everything, and you guys have your poker night and everything. But just to be able to, you know bring that trophy back and, and show it to Larry or was it, I mean, I would just think that that to me is, you know, it's, the, it's the young Padawan returning to the master with, with the, with the spoils of victory. Yeah, it was really cool. And Larry's he's, he's kind of put some pressure on me. He's like, Joe, you got to win. You got to win, man. You know, he's always told me that he's like, you have to win. You got to win. And, and so, yeah, it was, it was great, you know, doing it for, for him. I mean, obviously, you know, he's, he's, it's kind of like I've been in, you know, his son. I mean, and um, we've got a really close relationship. So, I mean, it was, it was great. And to do it for the, the group of guys there, um, it's, it was just, it was sweet. Yeah. So long-term, what, what's your, what drives you? What's your goal? Um, well, you know, I, I want to be, well, first off, I, my goal is to, to be a, you know, a respectable angler. Um, like, you know, that's why getting that win was huge. You know, like, Hey, this guy can win. I wanted that respect. Like, Hey, I'm, I'm an, I'm actually here, you know, as a professional, I can do this and make money. Um, and so, yeah, just to be that, you know, like a, a Gerald Swindle or uh, Brandon Paul and Nick, you know, consistent. My goal is to be as consistent as possible. Um, now that I've won, you know, I've got that, you know, Elite Series win, you know, I've got goals that I want to achieve. I mean, I would love to win Angler of the Year. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? Um, obviously, you want to make the – you want to try and win the Bassmaster Classic. I mean – 
that would be a sweet thing. So my goal, my ultimate goal though, is to, to keep doing what I'm doing, make enough money to provide for my family. Cause they're number, you know, they're number one there. Um, and to, and to give, you know, be able to do this and provide for them successfully, you know, I mean, that's, that's really my ultimate goal. Um, if it ever comes to where it doesn't make sense and I can't do it because I'm not fishing well enough, then, you know, I'm going to have to go somewhere else. I mean, that's just, that's just the, the way it is, but um, yeah, I'd love to make this a, a full career for 40 years like Larry Nixon. It'd be awesome. What is the coolest thing about your job? I mean, there's so many cool moments and I think people, you know, there's the stage stuff and all that stuff that stands out as, as, you know, a highlight on a TV show, but I, I always find talking to you guys, there are so many moments that are more important to you outside of the stuff that everybody sees. So what, what is the coolest thing like for you about being an elite series pro? What is the moment that you look forward to or, and not just an elite series pro as a professional angler that, you know, Hey man, I'm, I'm here, I'm doing this. Um, I think it's, it would probably be the fans in the, in the little, you know, the kids like, yeah. you know, I mean, that to me is, that to me is the coolest part. Um, I, I look at something I think about is like the, in the influence that I have on, on kids and people, um, in the, in the platform that I have. And, and I think that's the coolest part and signing the, you know, man, I signed a couple autographs, but I won that elite series event on Seminole, dude. I, there was a line of people forever that wanted to get my autograph. And that was, you know, that's cool. It's like, Hey man, I'm, you know, I've done it. I'm, I'm a, I'm a pro or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a name in this industry. And so that, that was really cool to me. Those moments, um, they're, they're sweet. And, and I think it's real important to identify that too. I've always kind of said in weirdly enough, I think one of the best things a future elite series pro can do is, is meet a celebrity from whatever sport that isn't nice. Cause there is lots of them, you know what I mean? And then you, but you, anybody who's ever had one of those experiences, they, they pay, spend more time with the fans. I find, you know what I mean? Because you realize yeah. how quick, like somebody could be like, wow, that cowboy guy is cool. You could ruin that for the rest of his life or her life just by just by just being nonchalant and not realizing the moment. So I think it's important that you realize that. Um, did you meet any celebrities growing up that let you down? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, no, I, I don't know. Not really. I don't think I've ever met a celebrity to be honest no. with you. Right. I mean, well, besides I you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I met I met Pete Rose once and he was a total jackass. Total jackass. Oh, really? Did didn't even I met him in Vegas and it was it was one of those. And before that, I was like, Yeah, Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame and everything. And now I'm I'll pick at the Hall of Fame if they ever put him in. <laughs> but it was like one of those things where um he was doing a meet and greet or whatever. And it will, you know, so which I always find those things are weird, anyways, because you line up kind of like cattle to, you know, meet Pete. And, uh, but it was kind of weird. And there was nobody lined up, really. Like he does, he signs cards in this place, um, I think w one weekend every month. So it's like there's not a lineup because people that have already seen him have seen him type things. So, but anyways, it's Pete Rose. I'm pretty impressed by him, but I go to meet him. Dude, he's a TV right beside him and he is this is a man whose career was ruined over betting on sports he is watching college football and openly talking about how much he has bet on these <laughs> games um and dude, he, like he literally like couldn't uh, you know i think we bought a shirt and he had to sign the shirt and he literally didn't even look up from the thing and then you're supposed to go take a picture with him and he's watching the game he's like Hey, how was your, what's your name? And I'm like, I'm Dave. And he fills it out and whatever. And he's like, well, thanks for coming. And then we're supposed to take a picture and he's watching TV the whole time. And he turns just for the picture and he goes back to TV. And I, like, I walked out of there and I'm like, I, I don't even want this shirt anymore. This guy was just a total jackass. But anyways, I digress. What is the toughest part about your job? Yeah, I think it's without a doubt being away from your family. Um, I, you know, some guys don't have, you know, kids and a wife and um, that's got to be really nice. You know, the freedom 
<laughs> but uh um yeah i think it's the the kids you know my 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 oldest daughter she's four and um this past trip was the longest trip four weeks on the road fishing tournaments and she was crying bawling every night on facetime and before i left you know wanting me to stay and so that's that's the hardest part i would say um I don't, besides that, I mean, I don't think there's anything else. It's just the leaving your family and, and, um, the kids not seeing you, which we got FaceTime now, so it's not as bad and stuff like that, but, but, uh, not being there. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's it, that's the tough part, but I always tell people it's the toughest thing to leave, but the greatest thing to come home to, you know, that that's the upside oh, yeah. of it. And, uh, but yeah. speaking of, of crying and whining, I'm going to ask you this because I'm sure you've heard this. What do you think when you hear people say things like tournaments won on forward facing sonar deserve to have an asterisk beside them? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think that's stupid. Um, <laughs> it's what, it's a tool that we have to use and, um, you know, I'm going to use it. I mean, I'd be, I think I'm dumb for not, knowing how to use it or, or take advantage of it. So, um, it's just where we're at right now in the, in, in our world. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to use it, take advantage of it. And, and, um, I, I don't agree with that at all. I think it's like, you know, if you look back at the things that have come out, um, side scan and whatever, all the other stuff is, it's, it's not really any different to me. It's, it's just another tool to see fish now it's pretty advanced obviously you can see them swimming around and and uh you can single you know go catch single fish or whatever like it's 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 very very interesting i mean it's almost like you're you're looking at fish all the time throwing at them but it's it, it's a tool we have to use i mean we we have to use and shoot i mean if they ban it you know we'll have to go to something else but i don't I don't see why. I mean, it, 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 it is what it is. So yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't like any of that talk. <laughs> yeah, no. And I mean, it's your job to, to catch fish for a living. I mean, I, I don't yeah. know that it's a weird time, but I also think I, I saw a comment that somebody posted somewhere a few weeks ago and it, you know, it made total sense, but he's like, you know, not too long ago, there was a guy named D Thomas that showed up at tournaments and he had, you know, this big long rod. He was using super heavy line and he was flipping and people called, said it would, he's now accessing fish that nobody ever had access to. He's, it, these fish are, are naive and stupid. So that you're going to catch more fish than any fishery could ever handle. He's going to outfish the fishery and that's flipping. You know what I mean? That just because yeah. he was the first and I don't really have a stance on it. I mean, my only negative about it is it is a lot more boring to watch in some situations. Um, sure, yeah. It's like talking to somebody when they're texting, you know, but um, I just think it's a perpetual argument. People are always going to argue, you know, over whatever the latest, greatest technology is. And um, clearly it is the latest and greatest of technology. How are, were you an early adopter in the forward facing? Cause I feel like we're at a spot right now where you got some guys who are really good with it. you got some guys who have really let it kind of slide and are nervous right now that, uh Oh, this thing's coming faster. Where were you on that? Um, I kind of pushed back on it at first, actually, uh, didn't use it for, for a couple of years fishing on tour. And, um, and then I, I just wanted to, it was like, I, I got to learn this thing, you know, cause there was guys starting to win tournaments on it and stuff like that. So now, I mean, I, I wasn't on the forefront of it at all. Um, but I did, you know, I started putting it on my boat every year and, and taking advantage of it. So, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it is, there, there's, there's always going to be like, if we can't imagine anything the technology on what we have getting better. Right. Like I think about like, what more could we have besides forward facing, but there will be something else oh, yeah. without a doubt. And, you know, people are going to say the same thing about it. So, I mean, I don't know. Did you, did you, and hopefully you're comfortable answering this. Did you put up with much hate or anything after your win over that? Um, 
None, none to my face. Uh, no, but like through all. social or anything, you never saw any of that. Oh yeah, I mean there was there was people. I mean I think during the event, you know, um, I had there were several people that came up to me and told me, hey, we were we were com-. there was people commenting on like, oh, you know, here's another guy using forward facing sonar or whatever. But I don't care, Dave. I mean, they can say whatever they want and um, doesn't affect me anyway. I mean, I I'm gonna do whatever I'm gonna do anyway. So, but no, it. I mean. I don't get into all the comments and stuff on social. I mean, I, I'll look at a few, but but I don't really care. I mean, it, it's I'm doing what I'm doing, and that's it. <laughs> so yeah, and I I think it's wrong that you guys should even have to deal with that. You know, like first of yeah. all, I mean, you didn't make the decision. I mean, to be clear, Bass didn't make the decision to make forward facing sonar a thing. You know what I mean? It was a technology that came, and and you, it's your job to take advantage of every bit of technology that there is um you you said you don't get involved in social media the comments and stuff which is which is very very wise because it's it is a toxic toxic world how what is your relationship with social media is it is it a necessary evil or is it something that um that you embrace or or what's your thoughts on social media as a professional angler um i think it's i think it's a great I think it's a great tool. Um, you know, I, I get messages all the time. People asking me fishing stuff, you know, how to catch fish or what technique and stuff like that. Like, it's great. I mean, I just think people, um, they know that they can say whatever they want and, you know, they're not going to get punched in the face <laughs> for saying it. And, uh, um, so, you know, it's just, I don't know, man. I mean, there's good and bad and all of it, but, um, I think there's, I think there's a lot of good. I, I, I try and use it, um, to the good, the best I can and, and, um, try and promote positive stuff and things. And, and that's, that's what I, that's what my focus is with it all. Uh, there's, there's always going to be, you know, negative people out there. And, um, so yeah, I don't know. What, what is the, uh, what's the dumbest thing you've ever done to just go fishing, like to get out of something, whether it be work or, a commitment or what, what is the dumbest thing you've ever done? Um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> um, I'm trying to think like, you know, that story I was telling you about when I was in college, um, I didn't really care about, you know, what I was supposed to be doing in the, in the baseball world. And, going out and going fishing and, and hunting and stuff, you know, getting in trouble over it. It's kind of stupid anyway, but, um, it's not like I was doing bad stuff or anything like that, but I, I don't know, Dave. I mean, um, no, I can't really Cowboys think of any, don't do dumb things. Cowboys don't do dumb things. I, well, that's a false statement. Um, there's a lot of stupid stuff I do in the, in the cowboy in world, but, um, as far as fishing, man, I just, I don't know. I mean, I can't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. All right. What's the dumbest thing you've ever done in the cowboy world? Um, you know, get on animals I shouldn't have got on in college. <laughs> <laughs> so when I went to college, I was all my roommates were on the rodeo team. Like we had rodeo teams and stuff, all the colleges I went to and or the two colleges I went to. So um, you know, we we would we would go hop on some bulls or some, you know just horses that were crazy or, you know, just, just dumb stuff like that or try and rope something. Or, uh, my buddy one time had, um, he had some, a couple dogs and he had little branding rods for his dogs. He was, I think that's a thing, you know, some guys brand their dogs with their, with their brand and, uh, with, you know, and so, uh, we were hanging around and, um, I said, well, you can brand me if you want. So I, I got branded. I got branded on my chest and come on. I, yeah, I did that. So that's pretty dumb. You know, just being a tough idiot. I Is guess. it still there? <laughs> I mean, clearly you, you still yeah. have it, right? You got to show oh, yeah. it. You got to show it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. See it, if this, uh, it's kind of faint right there. You see a C. Oh my dude. How so, many beer did you drink? <laughs> I mean, uh, I've, there was there was a maybe a couple involved in that one, but um, <laughs> but yeah, it 
it, I don't know. I actually branded myself before in high school. I was in shop class and one of my buddies came up to me and, and um, he had a piece of metal and he shaped it like a C and he did it on my arm. It looks terrible. Um, you can't really tell that one very good. So I don't know. I got a kind of high, high pain tolerance. So it doesn't really affect me. And I was, I was always the, you know, like the guy that you didn't think I could do something like I'm going to do it. You know, one of them things, <laughs> which doesn't get you real far. Uh, you shouldn't do a lot of that stuff. So I've changed a lot since then. I'm just going to tell you. If we, if you win the Bassmaster Classic, can we heat up the world on top of that trophy and just brand you with it? If I win the Bassmaster Classic, <laughs> I will get a brand made, and we will will put it wherever you want, Dave, right there on stage. What? <laughs> I've I've never wanted I'll, somebody to win the Bassmaster Classic more in my life. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> I, I'll do it in a heartbeat. I mean. It's not that big a deal, you know, the the little I'm not a big tattoo guy, but yeah. um something about a brand is a little more manly to me, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's de it's definitely <laughs> definitely something. Well, so you have you ridden you said you jumped on a bunch of animals that you shouldn't have. Have you rid have you ridden a bull? Yeah, but I mean it wasn't like like, you know, in a competition or anything like that. It was just at the, you know, after rodeo practice at, in college. I mean, I wasn't in the practice. I was, I was hanging out with all those guys. So, but yeah. What, what yeah, not is go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say it wasn't like a, and it, it wasn't a, you know, real nasty one or real big one either. It was kind of a medium size, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't too crazy, but. What, what is that moment when you're right before like you jump on a critter, whether it be a bull, a horse, whatever. What is that moment? Like, do you even think about it or is it just, no, yeah, let's do this. Next thing you know, yeah. you're. <laughs> yeah. You don't think about what you're doing. You just, you just hop on and go. That's the best way to do it. So did you last for eight seconds? Is that how long you're supposed to last for? No, right? no. No. no, How long you no, think no, you had? Oh, I don't know. Maybe about two and a half seconds. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I was in I was in way better shape at that moment in my life too. I mean, I was I was pretty fit, you know, being working out with baseball and stuff like that. I was pretty strong, but um yeah, there's no there's no way I'd do that now. Um, hop on a bull or anything like that, because you know, I don't want to die and leave my family alone. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, because I decided to jump on a bull, you know, it's yeah. kind of dumb. It's amazing yeah. as you age and as you have dependence and family around you that matter how you start to think of like risk versus reward at one time it was like yeah well hell yeah i'm gonna ride this bull then it's like yeah yeah my, my uh, dad died riding a, a little bull <laughs> not even a big <laughs> one <laughs> well i i told matt um i was when we were at lay lake i told matt i asked him for some baits and he said i got him and he gave him to me and and uh i don't know we started talking about riding a bull or something like that. And I said, he could come over to the farm one day. We could hop on some steers, you know, like that, that wouldn't be a big deal. We could do that. It'd be pretty funny to see him get on something like that. And me, um, so I'd be willing to do that, but he said, he's down, you know how he is. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> he, he will die doing something stupid. Um, yeah, but nobody will be shocked. People will be like, did you hear he, well, let's not give him any ideas, but he did this and nobody will be <laughs> like, Nobody would be like, oh, are you kidding me, Matt? Did that? Um, how big is your farm? So so you like do you, you actively farm when you're not on the Elite Series? And how like what kind of I don't even know how to ask this question. That's the city that I am. How how many head of cattle or whatever do you have? <laughs> yeah, so um we have so when I moved to Arkansas, my dad bought a piece of property about 200 acres, but it joins a bunch of my my mom's family land because my grandma was born here in Arkansas. So like there's they they had had some land here. So we've got probably like 600 acres that we run cows on, um, and we've got about about 40 head of mama cows. I've got uh, like right now I got a bunch of heifers that I kept. Uh, we've got you know about 40 steers out there um couple bulls so i mean i don't know how you, you can add all that up but um a bunch. and you know, yeah and we've got a bunch of other different uh little animals and stuff like that but um yeah we just we just run the cows here on the farm 
Um, we just got done working them yesterday, you know, taking the bulls and doing a little snip snip on the, on the bulls to make them steer so they can, ha so we can have some nice meat. Uh, so I saw all my, I'm a cow calf operation. So, um, I basically just, you know, breed my cows. They have calves. Um, I grow them up. We sell the steers and the heifers and, um, you know, we feed out some throw in the freezer here on the farm. I love eating meat and beef. I mean, it's just one of the, my favorite thing to eat is a, a big, nice, juicy steak. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I just enjoy the, you know, the doing that. And, um, it's just fun to me and, and, and you, you can get into it like fishing, you know, getting a nice bull that puts out bigger calves and they grow faster crossbreeding them. And there's all it's, it's, you can get into it really in depth on, on cow and just like you can fishing. I mean, it's no different. So just something I enjoy doing. It's something I can do outside. Um, here when when we get back from the sabine river i'm gonna be on a tractor oh for weeks and weeks bailing hay so you know it's it's a lot of work um don't really have a lot of time to do it but uh we make it work so the thing that i know i have a few friends who have farms obviously and yeah. but the thing that stands out to me as a non you know i mean the most amount of animals that have ever been in my house are gen dogs and yeah, we've never had a cat, but dogs, <laughs> I guess. Um, but the thing that stands out to me, the farming that nobody thinks of is like, sure, you got to do it every day. You got to feed them. They're, they're relentless. They're like children. They always want something. But the middle of the night stuff where, oh, guess what? We're calfing tonight. Do you do all that stuff or, or is that a call to doc? Oh no. Yeah. We do all that stuff. We, we vaccinate our cows ourselves. We, I don't even use a veterinarian anymore. Um, which is kind of sad, but, uh, w when it comes to preg checking cows, which is check, you know, see if they're pregnant or not. Um, that takes a lot of years of knowing how you're doing. That's when I call doc or we have another vet docs kind of getting more in the retired stage. So, but I haven't really learned. I know I could, but we, we do everything. We work, work our cows herself um i if if we're calving and we got a calf stuck or something um we try and breed our cows where we don't have those issues so um you you can buy a bull that is a calf easing bull that will they'll put out smaller calves so you don't have that issue with your cows we we hardly ever really pull, we don't hardly ever pull calves if you have if you're raising heifers and they're smaller it's their first time calf um that's when you run into issues. Um, so, and I did that for a few years and it was nonstop, you know, having to pull calves and, and I just don't have the time for it with the fishing. I mean, it's too much. I mean, it's on the go fishing and, and, um, I, I have my brother-in-law helps me too. Uh, we're kind of together on the business though, but yeah, we, we do everything ourselves and, but we try and work it to where we have to do as little as possible. <laughs> Wise, wise, smart farmers. Yeah. I'd say you're, a, a, you said at the beginning that you're just kind of a cowboy, not like, but I think that's how you have to answer it. If you're really a cowboy, like there's nobody that's like, yeah, I'm a cowboy. Like you, right. you sound like a pretty legit cowboy to me. Um, what's your favorite movie? Man, it's going to be like an old Clint Eastwood. Of I mean, I, my grandpa, I remember when I was a kid, we, we, I, we grew up watching Westerns. My grandpa loved watching Westerns. Um, so when I can watch those, I watch them all the time at night in the bed before we go to bed. My wife doesn't really care for them, but um, just something about that old Western, you know, like I just, I love it. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, the good, bad, and the ugly, Clint Eastwood, um, anything, John Wayne, you know, he's good. Um, that's kind of that's kind of what I really like. Um, I don't, I'm not big on all the all the new new stuff that's come out. I'm kind of a old soul, if you will. So you're not going to see Fast and Furious 15 or whatever just came out? No, 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 <laughs> not even close, Dave. Don't even. I actually took me and my wife went on a date um, the other day, and um, we watched some chick flick because she she wanted to watch it, and it was terrible. But I did it for her. I wanted her to have a good time and watch something she likes to watch. So, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't like that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. The movie was terrible. What, what is, uh, what is your favorite 
favorite band, favorite music? Um, so I grew, when I grew up in high school, well, I love so much kind of, I, I love all kinds of music. When I was riding around with my dad, we were listening to classic rock when I was a kid. So I'm a big, I love classic rock. Um, I love, or when I moved to Arkansas, I didn't wasn't really into music that much, and everybody around here loved what we call red dirt country. Yeah, so you got uh, cross Canadian ragweed, turnpike troubadours. Lucero was a kind of that um, uh, uh, reckless Kelly. I mean, so the red dirt stuff I love. Um, I really like turnpike troubadours. They're they're I, I just like that style of music. I play I play music. Um, my wife, the reason I married her, well, one of the reasons is because she's a phenomenal singer. Um, and, and I love music and, and can play guitar. And I just bought a mandolin the other day. Um, I've got a banjo. I've got like six or seven acoustic guitars, a couple electric guitars. So I like country. I really like bluegrass too. Um, and I always, my parents listened to it some when I was a kid and I hated it. But it's weird how all those things change when you get older. You know, I, I don't like listening to a lot of, you know, rap crap, I call it. Um, just the, I don't know, I just enjoy the the kind of country music. There's another guy I really like, Coulter Wall. He's from your neck of the woods, um, Canada. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he's he's just, he plays like that old country Western music. And I like that. I like that a lot. So you're kind of a throwback, you would say, proudly. Like. Yeah, yeah, I'm a I'm a throwback guy. Um, just I can't get into the to the new stuff. Maybe that does that just happen when you get older? Like, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I'm pretty into it. my musical tastes are everything, literally everything except for super hardcore metal, like Tyler Rivette. <laughs> that stuff. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not a fan of, but I, I mean, I, I don't know that I, I mean, my, my tastes have kind of evolved, I guess, but dude, I'll listen to anything from literally the favorite, my favorite concert I've ever been to in my life was Willie Nelson. Um, he's one of my favorite, yeah. like that was, that was the concert that like I had to go to, but I, I've also, you know, seen just about everybody, you know, you name it out there. So, I mean, I, I just think you like what you like. And, and I think that it makes sense to me, like, the bluegrass thing, like I find myself with different music that my parents listened to that I was like, as a kid, I was like, this is just dumb or whatever. But as you get older, I mean, I think it it's natural that you should be connected to that because that song brings you back to a time in your life when you were a little kid, you know what I mean? And and whatever was happening in the world. I think that's one of the coolest things about music, how it it means something totally different to everybody one particular song but it, it it transcends time you know what i mean there's certain songs yeah. and i don't know what they are for you but there's certain songs i can play for you and right away you think of a person a place and that sort of thing so i think that's the coolest thing about music in my opinion I, i'm a big um i'm a big fan of of musicians especially singers i i think that it's just amazing to be able to like if you have a powerful voice like to be able to just sing us like you know what i mean entertain a crowd with just your voice is, is truly amazing to me so so uh, well <clears throat> something we got to do um so my my wife like i said she's a singer so i want to make sure whenever we because she's she's a teacher she's about to be ending her job and she's they're going to be traveling with me to some tournaments here especially towards the end of the year we got to get her to sing the national anthem at the you know blast off or whatever so deal you set that up yeah. deal you you He's let good. me know you know at at takeoff or at right before that i think that'd be awesome right before way and whatever we we um yeah. yeah i mean it pays nothing it it, it but it is a glamorous <laughs> job tell her like a, like the dozens and dozens will appreciate the effort that she puts in yeah. um so yeah we'll definitely make that happen but um you're having a great season, Sabine River. Next, you have you had any experience there? I mean, as people are watching this, it starts tomorrow morning. Yeah, no uh, I have 
zero experience on the Sabine. Um, I looked at the email that Lisa sent us and it was like, can't go here, can't go there, don't do this. So I'm like, I don't even know, man. Um, I guess I'll probably look at that a couple more times to figure out where I'm going to fish. But, but yeah, no, I don't, I don't know anything about it. I mean, it's, it's got to be tidal. I would assume that to some extent, depending on how close you are out there. So I've, I've been on some tidal places, Potomac river, um, James river done well on them. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm just going to go fishing. <laughs> I, I swear to you, I saw that same email because I get them too. And, and I looked at it and I swear to you, I was like, thank God I'm a tournament MC. Cause I just literally <laughs> had thought like, what is it? You basically can't go into any Louisiana waters, even if it's just to travel through it. So like, there's all these maps of you can go around this side of the Island, but you can't go around that side of the Island. It, yeah, that's gotta be one of the toughest things as a pro, you know, go into these fisheries and you only have two and a half days to crack the code, but also you've got to figure out how to get around there. Yeah, that's, that's, that's going to be a hard part. And yeah, I don't understand like why we can't, fish or, or i don't know i don't know yeah they, that, that's tough i mean so i'm just gonna stick to the safe stuff and try and survive like if i feel like if i can make the cut and survive the sabine river um i feel really confident on everything else we got coming up the rest of the year um so but you know sometimes going into these new places you do really well too so um but yeah it's it's tough trying to Go, I, but I, I don't know that I've ever fished a place where we had all these little things we can't go in and do stuff before. I, I don't think I've ever experienced that. But I mean, it's just as long as it's all listed there. So I know, I mean, I can look at the map. I mean, it's not hard to figure out. Yeah, but it's kind of kind of weird. I figured we could just go wherever we wanted. But yeah, th there's Louisiana laws that are and I don't even want to uh, get into because I don't even know the. I mean, it's it's got to do with private property. It's got to do it's just all sorts of. Trust me, uh, I can guarantee you, Lisa and the tournament team would love to not deal with that. Um, but right. it, it's yeah. it's a you know the Louisiana thing is a I didn't want to get into it. I love the fine people of Louisiana, but there is some weird laws there that make it a, a little difficult. Um, but man, it, it's been uh, it's been an incredible start to your season. And um, talk to me about the rest of the season though, because you did say that your smallmouth prowess um did it does that where does that come from as a kid who grew up in florida i mean the spinning rod thing makes sense but you you seem to have really done well smallmouth bass fishing yeah um i've had people ask me that all the time and i still don't really know a great answer for it except that um you know we've we've got i've had some experience with smallmouth here in arkansas like we, we, we fight to catch a three pounder. Like it's, yeah. a, it's a, it's a great thing when you catch a three pound smallmouth here. And I, I love it. I love it. Um, and something else is before I really went, you know, pro, um, fishing on the front of the boat or on the front side during that kind of college, like through my college years in the summertime, we would go make a trip every year to Minnesota, go fish on a lake up there. It's called Lake Vermilion um and had a blast catching for you know three four five pounds smallmouth and i just i just love it i don't know why i've kind of been good at it um it to me it doesn't seem really hard it, i like them because they bite like you throw yeah. a bait in front of their mouth like they bite you know i mean i don't think there's that's what i love i love about smallmouth they're they're pretty easy to catch so um i don't know man i mean i just i just love catching them and I, I think I've just been fortunate to do well in, in, in those tournaments, but you know, who knows? We'll see how the rest of the year goes. Well, I think we're pretty fortunate to have you on the elite series, but before we part ways, I have one more question for you. What is the best advice you've ever been given in your life? Best advice I've ever been given in my life. Well, it's all pretty much come from my dad. <clears throat> um, You know, the what the 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 biggest thing that he's ever told me, 
Um, and it's, it's so true. And anything you do in life is positive attitude. Um, you know, Gerald's got the positive mental out, out attitude thing. And I love that. i uh, watched a lot of stuff that he's talked on on that. And it's, it's, it's very true. I mean, you can't be negative. You have to be positive. Um, and the other advice that, you know, my dad gives me is whatever, whatever you want to do, you know, no matter what, you know, don't let anybody tell you that you can't because you can, I mean, um, you don't have to have, you know, this and that to do that. You know, you can, you can be successful as long as you, you know, keep a good attitude and, um, and do whatever it takes to, to get it done. And, um, you know, that's, that's been, that's been a huge, I think that's why I am and who I am today and why I'm here fishing the elite series to be honest with you, because my, my dad's instilled that in me. And, um, I feel like I can do anything. Like I can learn anything you, you get, hand me whatever, I'll figure out how to do it and I'll do it better than you. That's just the way I am. Um, and I've, and so, so yeah, I would, I would say it's just the, the positive, the positive attitude. You can't be negative and, and do whatever it takes to, to be successful. And, um, you know, that's, that's it. It's great advice. It's a great way to live life. And, um, it's been a great conversation. The next time I see you, we'll both be uh, sweltering hot. I mean, I'll probably be sweating a little more than you, but it's a, it's going to be hot this week. Yes, it's going to be a scorcher. You like the heat? You, 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 I mean, you're Florida, Arkansas. You must love heat. Oh yeah, it gets it gets hot here in Arkansas, <laughs> and it's humid and hot, and it's terrible. So yeah, I don't love it. I mean, who loves the heat? I don't know, but. Um, I don't mind it. I mean, I'll, I'm probably going to take me some, uh, I love wearing my jeans and I'm probably going to lob these off. You're going to come off. Some, yeah. I'm just going to have some little, some jean shorts, jorts, you know, some jorts. And, um, you know, I you, think, uh, that'll keep me cool. I, I look forward to seeing the jorts. <laughs> You'll, yeah, I mean, there is some famous fish in history in jorts. I mean, Davy height, Rock the Jorts, very strong back in the day. Also, uh, Hall of Fame, Bass Fishing Hall of Fame writer Louis Stout loves a good set of jorts. So interesting. I look forward to seeing your jorts and uh, thank you for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it, Dave. Oh, before we go. So, one more time. If he wins the bet, if you win the Bassmaster, just tell us what you'll do. If you win the Bassmaster Classic, if I, oh, you already said it, I will or you will brand the is it the globe what is the logo well whatever we'll just we'll yes sure the, we're just gonna the get bass, yeah class i'm gonna shape get or something some kind of some kind of bass or maybe just bass we're gonna do it branded i don't know i don't know where um probably maybe we should do it on the just right on the chest. I was going to say the butt, <laughs> but that that would take pulling no. the pants down in front of people. I don't yeah. really want to do that. No, no, I don't. Um, want you don't want to pull my pants I, down, do you? No, no, no. Let's just or brand my butt. We'll we'll <laughs> figure it out. We got lots of time, but he's committed to do it. And, I will and do he, it in a heartbeat. Oh boy, I can't wait. Um, you thought <laughs> you thought Tyler Rivette ripping his shirt off as a victory was offensive? Stay tuned. <laughs> 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 the cowboy joseph fuentes thank you appreciate it all right well the goal was to learn a lot about joseph fuentes and i think we did learn and, and a legit cowboy he is with that in mind i need everybody watching here to help me do something i don't know if we have anybody from one of the big hat companies resist all stetson american hat company whatever cowboy hat company it is maybe you your uncle works there your aunt works there you have a friend that works there just some kind of contact reach out to them and tell them they need to do a deal with the cowboy joyce fuentes i mean they can own an actual market you think about all of the cowboys they would sponsor at a rodeo event i mean they're all wearing cowboy hats well there is one one that wears them at elite series events and it's joey Cifuentes. and let's just show the power of this show i mean can we do it can, can we can, can somebody come up with a hat company 
that wants to work with Joey. And if we can, I mean, um, it's a nice thing to do. Really, that's, that's all I got. And doing nice things is an important part of life. So go out there this week. Do some nice things. Call your cowboy hat manufacturer friends and get Joey Sefuentes a deal. And I hope you enjoyed this podcast where we got inside the mind of another amazing angler. And we'll be back next week with uh, some more goodness. Next week, we'll be back with Jake's Take from Orange, Texas, right after the event. What's going to happen this time? Always an adventure in Orange, Texas. Have a great week. Enjoy being and take care. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?